Hey guys, welcome to another anatomy video. Hope you guys are having a great day. And today, I want to start off this video by asking you guys a question. In this image right here, I have four pictures of four different parts of the skeletal system. Now, the question is, apart from them being skeletal structures, what is the one thing they have in common with each other? Well, the answer to that question is that they're all displaying different types of joints. And that's what this video is going to be about. This is the first video of arthrology. So we're going to talk about joints. And each image displays different types of joints. Now, what is a joint? A joint is the junction or the union of two skeletal structures and teeth coming together. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I look at this bottom left image, I'm drawing out along this line. This line is called a suture, and a suture is a form of joint, and we know that joints are the junction between the two different bones. Right here we have the temporal bone, and right here we have the sphenoid bone. If we look up here, there are two separate parts of the sternum, and right in between the two of them is another joint. So again, the definition of a joint is when you have teeth or bony structures come together and they're held together either by connective tissue or cartilage. Those are considered as joints. And we're going to go over different types of joints as well in this video. So we can go ahead and move on to the next image. And in this image, we have two separate pictures taken, one of a shoulder joint and one of the elbow joint. And so my second question is, what's the difference between these two? Well, if we look over in the left image with the shoulder joint, we have one bone here and we have another bone here. We have the humerus and the scapula and they're articulating right here, forming the shoulder joint. This type of joint is considered a simple joint. A simple joint is when two bony structures or a teeth and a bony structure come together and form a joint. So again, a simple joint only has two bony components. Compared to the elbow joint, we have one, two, three bones forming this joint. This type of joint is a complex joint. Another way you can call it is a composite joint. And it's defined as a joint made up of three or more skeletal structures. Apart from whether a joint is made up of two, three, or even four bony structures, joints are classified by what holds them together. So in this image, right here I've written down three different classifications that tell us how these joints are united together. So to start off with, we're going to go ahead and move on to the fibrous joints. Now a fibrous joint can also be called synarthrosis. That's just the Latin for fibrous joint. And it's characterized by this connective tissue proper that holds them together. Having connective tissue proper, or you can condense it calling it CT proper, is the main defining characteristic compared to the other two joints. Now, syndesmosis, sutures, and gomphoses are three subtypes of the fibrous joints. A syndesmosis has a unique characteristic in that it has a large amount of connective tissue proper. There are only three pairs of syndesmoses found in the body. And we will cover those when we get to naming joints. Sutures are only found in the bones of the skull. There are in fact 33 sutures named and they're all found between flat bones in the skull. Now, within sutures, there are four subtypes of sutures, and they're all named based on how they're united to their neighboring bone. A serrated suture is kind of like your fingers interlocking with your other fingers on the other hand. 
like this. They're jaggedy on one side and the other bone is jaggedy and it fits right in here like a puzzle piece would. That is a serrated suture. A squamous suture, also called a lap suture, overlaps one another. So we have one flat bone right here that laps like this, and then the neighboring bone unites with it by lying over it. This is a squamous or a lap suture. A planar suture is when you have two blunted ends of two different bones come together and they're united like this. This is a planar suture, just the two blunted ends united with CT proper. And the last type of suture is called shindelesis, and there's only one of these found in the human body. This is characterized by having a tongue and groove-like union. Right here we have the groove, and this is what's considered the tongue, and again it fits in just like a puzzle piece would, and then the CT proper holds it together. And again, I will identify where this shindelesis is located in a future video. The last type of fibrous joint is gumphoses. And all gumphoses are, are joints between bone and teeth. So if we remember this bony landmark located in the maxilla and the mandible, these are called dental alveoli. Within them are teeth. Now what holds those teeth together? Well, there's joints right here. This connective tissue proper that holds the teeth within the dental alveoli of the maxilla and the mandible, these joints are called gumphoses. And those are all the different types of fibrous joints. Now we can go ahead and move along to cartilaginous joints. Like the name suggests, cartilaginous joints are held together by cartilage. And there are two types of cartilages that form these joints. The first one being hyaline cartilage. So hyaline cartilage joints are found in several places in the body, especially when long bones have not yet fully matured. The reason why I say that is because if we remember what the physis is, the physis, or the epiphyseal cartilage of a growing long bone, is made of hyaline cartilage. So technically, all growing bones that have an epiphyseal cartilage or physis are held together by hyaline cartilage joints. Another example of a hyaline cartilage joint is the xiphosternal synchondrosis. As the name suggests, you may not know where the xiphosternal synchondrosis is right now, but in a later video, I will identify it for you. The last type of cartilaginous joint is the fibrocartilage joints, or the symphyses. An example of a fibrocartilage joint is the manubrial sternal symphysis. And those are the two different types of cartilaginous joints. In the future, you'll be asked to identify the classification of any joint that's been indicated. Now, you are required to know the most specific classification of that joint. For example, if I pointed to a xiphosternal synchondrosis, I wouldn't want you to answer by saying it's a cartilaginous joint. The way you would want to respond to that question is by identifying it as a hyaline cartilage joint or a synchondrosis. So it is important to know the main classifications of these joints, but it's more important in my mind that you know the more specific classifications, such as the hyaline cartilage joint, the fibrocartilage joint, as well as the syndesmoses, the sutures, and the gymphoses. Okay? So keep that in mind as you guys study over arthrology. The last major classification of joints are synovial joints. Synovial joints, like fibrous joints, are united with CT proper. But the difference between the synovial joints and the fibrous joints is that synovial joints, or diarthroses, have an articular cavity that is filled with synovial fluid. The synovial fluid provides nourishment to the joint as well as lubrication because these joints are the most mobile. They're the ones that have the most range of motion. There are seven subtypes of these synovial joints and they're listed below. We have a ball and socket joint. We have ellipsoid or condylar joint. We have bicondylar joint, ginglimus or hinge joints, 
trochoid joint, saddle joints, and planar joints. And I'm going to go through each one of them and kind of talk about their characteristics. The first one is ball and socket joint. A classic example of a ball and socket joint is the hip joint. Ball and socket joints are pretty cool because they can move in many ranges of motion. They can go anterior, posterior, they can move laterally or medially, and they can also rotate their axis. That's what makes the ball and socket joint the most movable and flexible joint out of all the synovial joints. The ellipsoid or condylar joint is similar to the ball and socket joint, but it doesn't have the rotating ability that the ball and socket joint does have. An example of an ellipsoid joint is the radiocarpal joint. And again, this is called an ellipsoid or condylar joint. Awesome. Now, by condylar joint, it's very similar to a condylar joint, hence the names being very similar. The difference being that you have two condylar surfaces compared to one. An example of this is the knee joint. Remember, you have two condyles of the knee joint and they articulate with the top surface of the tibia. This would be an example of a bicondylar joint. This is an image of a hinge joint. It's not as movable as the ball and socket joint is or even the condylar joint. A prime example of a hinge joint would be the elbow joint. An elbow joint can't rotate, it can't shift left or right. All it can do is flex and extend. And that is an example of a hinge joint. This is called a trochoid joint. You can also call it a pivot joint. The reason why it's called a pivot joint is because it's only allowed to rotate within this range of motion. It kind of rotates in a ring. An example of this would be the atlantoaxial joint. If you think about what the atlas looks like and the axis looks like, here this kind of looks like the dens of the axis, does it not? And then this would be the anterior arch of the atlas. When there is movement within the atlantoaxial joint, the dens of the axis is pivoting within the anterior arch, therefore becoming a trochoid joint. Now moving on to saddle joints. Now saddle joints are unique because they can move from side to side and they can also move back and forth. There are only two pairs of joints that fall underneath this category, one of them being the first carpal metacarpal joint. And finally, the last subcategory of the synovial joints is the planar joint. Now, similar to a planar suture, the planar joint only has an articulation between a flat surface or a blunt surface. And that's all it is, as you can see here in this image. An example of this would be an intercarpal joint. Just two blunt surfaces rubbing against one another. And that's what a planar joint is. And those are all the different categories and subcategories found within joints. Now this video had a lot of different terminology, so I advise you to rewatch it and also to study your lab manual. One of the biggest challenges that students have in anatomy is identifying joints and their classifications. So be sure that you understand each classification individually. That way when you learn the names of the joints, you'll be further ahead in identifying each and every one of them. Hope this video was helpful and I'll see you guys later.